Hello everybody, uh, I'm really happy to give you here a bit more information about the program Beamline for Schools. So I'm going to talk to you uh, about two topics right now. The first one is what are particles and the second will be what are beams. So we're inviting you to come and work with uh, particle beams here at CERN. And I just want to give you a bit of background information. My name is Pauline Gagnon and I'm a physicist here on the ATLAS experiment at CERN. So we're going to talk about uh, particles because at CERN, CERN is this uh, European laboratory for particle physics and it's located near Geneva in Switzerland. So there are 12,000 scientists working here coming from 99 different nationalities. It's financed by European countries, but there are many other countries participating in the research. For example, Canada, United States, Pakistan, India, lots of uh, countries in fact. All these people have one common goal, and it's to find out what matter is made of. If I was to ask you this question when we are visiting uh, Legoland in uh, Copenhagen, you know Lego blocks, they were invented in Denmark. So in Denmark they have a museum for Lego blocks, which is called Legoland. And at Legoland, here is the version of the Copenhagen old uh, harbor, and everything is made of Lego blocks. And there, if I was to ask you, what are the smallest particles? What are the smallest grains of matter? Then it's really easy. When nobody is watching, I grab one of the exhibit, I smash it, and I will see all the smallest particles that exist. So there it would be really easy to answer the question, what are the smallest building blocks of matter? So we see them. But when you look at matter, we know now that when we look at any type of matter, we know that there are, in fact, atoms inside there. And inside the atoms, we have the electrons that are sp uh, spinning around a hard nucleus in the center. Within the nucleus, you will find protons and neutrons. But within the neutrons and prot protons, we also find quarks. So if I ask you here, what are the smallest grains of matter that exist? In fact, the only ones that you cannot break any further are electrons and quarks. So those are the only fundamental particles uh, that we have on this picture. And in fact, you can build everything else from those particles. Let's look at protons and neutrons, for example. They are made of quarks. We have up quarks that have a charge of plus two thirds, and we have down quarks that have a charge of minus one third. And if I take two up quarks and one down quark, I can get a proton. The up quarks have charge, uh, a charge of plus two thirds, so I have two of them, plus I have a down quark with minus one third, so I get in total a, a charge of plus one. Same thing with the neutron, I can build it up with two down quark and one up quark, and this time their charges added up to zero, so we have a neutral particle here. So you can see I can build protons and neutrons all with quarks, and then if I add if I just combine protons and neutrons in various uh, numbers with the necessary number of uh, electrons, I can build every single atom that you find in the periodic table. So you can produce every chemical element that exists. So all matter is made of quarks and electrons. But in fact, all matter is made of particles, but there are more particles in nature than what I just said. In fact, there are two large families of particles, which we call the leptons and the quarks. In the lepton family, you find the electron, which I already uh, mentioned, and there's also the muon, which is about two, like an electron, but 200 times heavier. Tau particles are also similar, but they're about 4,000 times heavier than an electron. Each one of them comes with a neutrino, and neutrinos are pretty sneaky. You know, you, they, they cross uh, the Earth, for example, and they're not stopped. And that's why here, in, this is the representation of all the particles as you find them in the particle zoo. You can go on the web and find uh, about these particles. And that's how she, she uh, the woman who created them, put them with little mass, because they're really little uh, sneaky particles. So those are the leptons. And we have quarks, we have the up and down quarks that I just talked about. There are also the charm and strange quarks, which are heavier, and top and bottom quarks. All those particles existed in nature 
right after the Big Bang, but nowadays we only find them in particle accelerators. So the muons we can still find in nature, sometimes in cosmic rays. But in fact, to create all ordinary matter, all that we need is electrons, neutrinos, up and down quarks. So we can make all the ordinary matter with this. The other particles, we can still create them in the uh, accelerators, but we don't find them much in nature now. All these particles also interact with each other through various forces. And there are five fundamental forces in nature. And those forces are, uh, for example, the strong interaction, which is mediated by the gluons. Each force has a, a boson, a particle that we call a boson, that is associated with it. And all the grains of matter that we have here, they interact with each other by exchanging different particles. So they can, within within the protons and neutrons to keep the quarks glued together, we have the gluons. So that's the one that mediates the strong interaction. You have photons that are associated with the electromagnetic uh, force. W and Z bosons are uh, associated with the weak interaction, which is responsible for radioactivity. Graviton we have not found, but we think it might be there and it would be associated with gravitational force. And the Higgs boson was just found, and that's associated with a special field, which is called the Braut, Englert, and Higgs field, and that gives mass to all the other particles. So that's what we have. And in, in nature, in fact, we find lots of particles that are made of quarks. So I showed you protons and neutrons, but at CERN, we also work with various particles like pions. Pions are particles that are made of one up quark and one anti-down quark. What I didn't say uh, earlier is that all the particles that I showed, the 12 particles, they also have their anti-particle. So matter and antimatter, we always deal with that. They come together. So for a pion, you mix one quark of matter and an anti-quark of antimatter. And you get a positive pion with that because they have a charge of plus two-thirds and the anti-down quark will have the, its charge inverted so it gives plus one-third. You can get an a negative pion in a similar fashion. And you can also build a kaon by adding an up quark with an anti-strange quark. And then you get positively charged kaons. And you can also get a negatively charged kaon with a strange quark and an anti-up quark. So it gives you an idea of how we can mix those quarks and build other particles. And all these particles can decay. And a particle decay is like a particle that is heavy and unstable and it breaks apart. And it's a bit like making small change for a large coin. So you can start with a large coin of a, like a piece of two euro, a two euro coin, and break it into two pieces of one euro. And in this case, the total value has to be conserved, the total uh, amount of money that we have. When we deal with uh, particles, then we can start, for example, with a down quark, and it can emit a W boson and an up quark. And you will see that the down quark has a charge of minus one third, the W boson has a minus one charge, and the up quark plus two. So in this case, you see that the charge is conserved. Likewise, you can take a, the W boson here, and it can decay into an anti-up and a strange quark. And the charge is conserved all the time. And you can see that's the way we can obtain strange quarks from regular matter, for example. OK, so this completes now just my first introduction, the first part, which was all about particles. But now we're inviting you to come here to work with a beam. So we're going to talk now about beams. So what are beams? There is one type of beam that you know, which is a laser beam. And you've all uh, played with that. I have one right now here to my pointer is made of a laser beam. And in fact, what we don't see is that a laser beam is made of photons. So it, it in fact has little grains, little particles inside it. And at CERN, we can produce beams made of all sorts of uh, charged particles. For example, protons, electrons, pions, kaons, muons, all sorts of particles that I just mentioned. How do we do that? Well, we start by creating, first we start with proton beams. And we, extra, we uh, obtain the protons like this. We start with hydrogen atoms, because those are the simplest atoms. So we start with 
hydrogen atom has a proton in its uh, nucleus and an electron spinning around. So if I apply a strong potential difference between the two, I just plug you know, the two um, uh, on an electric uh, outlet and I get a positive uh, a pole and a negative pole. So what will happen is that the electron will be attracted to the positive pole here and the proton will be attracted to the negative pole. But what we do there, we play a trick on our proton and we flip the polarity on the proton just when the proton arrives there. What happens is that the proton has momentum, has speed already, and it keeps going and then it's pushed further and it keeps going. So how do we obtain our, um, our uh, proton beam? We simply start with a small bottle of compressed gas with, with hydrogen. The gas goes through an apparatus where we can apply a potential difference and we can extract our uh, protons this way. They're just ionized hydrogen atoms. And we throw away the electrons. And that goes into what we call the LINAC, which is a small uh, accelerator that you see here. So we get the protons from the hydrogen atoms by removing the electrons with an electric field. Then we accelerate the protons with another electric field inside a small linear accelerator, which we call the LINAC. And it, it's about 30 meters long. And you see about the size with a person next to it. And that's the first stage of a multi-stage uh, complex of accelerators that we have at CERN. So the first stage is here, the LINAC, the, this linear accelerator, where we get protons accelerated. And they get into what is called the proton synchrotron which is another accelerator, a circular one. And from there, they are ejected and it shoots proton into what is called the east area, which is an experimental area. And that's where you would be working if you come to CERN within this program. There is also, of course, the huge accelerator, which is the most known now at CERN, which is the Large Hadron Collider. That's 27 kilometers large, but that's further down the road. You would be working here on the east area with those uh, protons. Why do we need accelerators? Well, we need accelerators to be able to see small objects. And you can only see objects that are smaller than the wavelength that you're using. For example, if I'm using sound, as, as we do with a sonar, sonar. So with a sonar, you want to probe objects the size, for example, of a mountain. You can see if there is a mountain there because it's much bigger than the size of the wavelength associated with sound, which is about one meter. But you cannot see an object, a small object, like a, a small animal, like uh, this here, because it's smaller than the wavelength. If I want to study small objects, I need to use light, which has a wavelength that is much shorter. The wavelength is about half of a micron. A micron is one thousandth of a millimeter. So it's really tiny. So we can see objects, anything that is bigger than the wavelength, like a butterfly, but you cannot see something like an atom which is smaller than the wavelength. At CERN, we use beams that are, uh, we, we take beams that have very, very small wavelengths to be able to study structures that are extremely small, like, for example, inside the proton to go and see the structure with the, the quarks inside. So when we use a small wavelength, it also means that we use something with very high energy. The smaller the wavelength, the higher the energy. So how do we do that? Well, we start with our primary beam, and we will get secondary beam. Our primary beam is the proton beam that I described earlier. So we have our protons, and they come and they hit a target, a target is made of any type of material. And from there, from the interaction between the protons of the primary beam and the material of the target, you will see an array of uh, particles coming out. You will see protons, pions, kaons, electrons, all sorts of particles coming out. But then you can use magnets to select which type of particle you want. 
One nice property of uh, dipole magnets is that they act like a prism on light. You know that with light, you start with white beam, you go on the prism, and you get all the different colors. You can do the same thing with a, a dipole magnet. You shoot a beam of one type of energy, and it will the primary beam, the protons here, will interact, and you will get particles of various energies coming out. And Depending on the energies, they will all come out with a different, at a different angle. So you see, you could put, for example, a collimator, which is just a slit, to come and select one particular energy that you want to work with. So this will correspond to a particular energy and a particular type of particles. We measure the energy here in GeV, units of GeV for giga electron, vol electron volts. So you see, you can go and select what kind of particles you want from your beam. What we will give you is a beam line in the experimental area. And here is what you will get. So first of all, there is the primary proton beam that will hit a target, the primary target. And from that, we see that there is a, a secondary beam that will be selected from a magnet. Again, you will go and select what kind of particles you want. Then here, with you can use a secondary target and play the same trick again with a magnet and a collimator, a slit, just to go and select tertiary beam. But this is optional what you do. You have to remember though that every time you put a target, the particles will interact, the incoming particles will interact with the material in the target and you will lose a lot of the particles in the process. So if you start, for example, with 10 to 11 particles, you will find about 10 to the 6 at this level, and 10 to the 3 at this level. So you, you lose a lot of particles, and they also go down in energy as it, you go. What we would give you in the, this part is fixed. So that's the, the so-called T9 beam line that will be provided to you, and this is fixed. So you get a secondary beam, but you can put a target, and that's up to you what you put here, and if you put a, a, another magnet, and that's your, in the experimental area, and you can play with that. You can adjust which target you put and which um, particles you will select. Just to tell you a bit more what happens when the primary proton or pion beams will come and hit a target. What happens is that mostly you have two types of interactions. Some interactions are called hadronic interactions. Those are the ones where the quarks inside the particles that of the incoming beam will interact with the quarks of the, uh, inside uh, the atoms of your target. So from that, you will get mostly pions, the red lines that you see here, but you will also get some kaons coming out. There's a second type of interactions that we get. Those are called electromagnetic showers, and that's when the electric charges of the incoming particle interact with the electric charges of uh, the particles inside the atoms. And from that, you will get electrons, positrons, and photons. As you can see here, the electrons coming out. Or photons can also come out from a neutral pion decay. OK. So here's an, here is an example on how you can select the type of particles you get in your secondary or tertiary beam, uh, depending on the incoming particles, of course. If you put a target of beryllium, if you put 40 centimeters of beryllium, you will produce both pions and electrons. If you put copper, you would get only pions because all the electrons, that's a property of copper, it would absorb all the electrons. And if you use tungsten instead, you can produce many electrons, but all the pions will be absorbed. But the electrons here will have low energy. So depending what you want to do, you can play with the nature of the target and its thickness. What tools will you have to play with, to work with? You will have different tools that will allow you to identify charged particles, but also to detect their passage. So you can see if a charged particle passed, and you'll also be able to track them. That is, find out exactly where they passed. And you will be able to measure the energy of all the outgoing particles, charged or neutral particles. You'll get all the details on this document here. And uh, let me now give you, uh, to end, an example of uh, what can be done with a beam. 
So one technique that is uh, being studied at CERN now is called hadron therapy. And that's a new technique to fight cancer. So a way to kill cancer cells. And on the plot that I'm showing here, here is the uh, relative dose deposited in percentage, and here is the penetration uh, depth in millimeters in human tissue. So what we do, now the, the classic way to zap cancer cell is to do radiotherapy, and that's done with x-rays. X-rays are just photons of high energy. If you do that, you see the x-rays will deposit most of their energy close to the entrance point, and then less and less as they go in. Electrons would deposit all of their energy at the entrance and then very little. So it means that with x-rays you can zap efficiently cancer cells that are really close, but less if they are further inside the body. Whereas if you use protons or carbon, you see that it's quite different. It deposits very little energy and all of a sudden, whoops, it creates a huge peak of energy. All its energy of those particles are, all the energy is deposited at one specific depth, which you can tune, depending on the energy of the incoming particle. So it has a big, big advantage, is that it's way more efficient at zapping the cancer cell, and it has the benefit of not burning the healthy tissue, which is ahead of the cancer cell. So it's a much better technique, and this is getting uh, uh, used now. So this is the kind of thing that we can study, for example, to see if effectively you can find this peak, and you could simulate a, a human tissue by putting simply water, because most of human tissue is water, so that would do the trick. Okay, would you like to try this? Well, if you, if you do, then you would win a free trip to CERN for nine students and two teachers with all the expenses uh, covered while you stay here. And you need for that, all you need to do is to tell us at this point that you're interested. And to do that, you send us an email, uh, a tweet of intent, where you just uh, tell us that you're interested in um, doing this exp uh, an experiment, and you give us the name of your school, your, your names, and your teacher's name, and that's it. And then you have two more months to, f to cook up your experiment and to figure out all the details. And all... The details about this uh, competition are given here. What will you be judged on? First of all, the goals of this exercise is simply for you to have fun. We want you also to learn about beams and how they interact with matter and give you the opportunity to work in the largest particle uh, physics lab in the world. The selection criteria are quite simple. We will create... Uh, we will simply uh, judge you on your creativity and if it's a, a feasible uh, project, if it's something completely uh, far-fetched not real, that you cannot uh, do, then of course it won't be uh, selected. So it has to be creative and you have to show your motivation. And you must demonstrate as well that you're able to apply the scientific method, the one from Galileo, uh, that says that you, you postulate and uh, you make a hypothesis, you design a way to test this hypothesis, and then you show that you can analyze the data. So this is what, what we will be uh, uh, judging you on, and I hope that you uh, are interested and that many of you will apply, and uh, I tell you, it's great fun to work here at CERN. I hope to see you this, this summer. The project will be done in the summer.